you take for? Für die Suite in diesem Londoner Luxushotel bezahlt Frank Zappa pro Tag 200 Mark. Trotzdem verbietet ihm das Hotel, dass wir ihn darin filmen. Die Direktion befürchtet, dass er mit unserer Hilfe einen Sexfilm dreht. Als wir das, was Sie gerade gesehen haben, aufnehmen, wird ihm auf dieser Karte die unmittelbare Kündigung für den nächsten Tag übermittelt. Das ist einer der Gegensätze, mit denen Frank Zappa lebt. Die Gesellschaft sieht noch immer in ihm den bösen, wilden, aggressiven Mann, der er vor zwei Jahren vielleicht einmal war, der aber mittlerweile einer der bekanntesten Popstars geworden ist. Die Leute aber, die ihn damals verehrten, sagen jetzt, er habe ihre und seine Ideen verraten und nicht zuletzt, so vordergründig das klingen mag, weil er überhaupt in solch einem Hotel lebt. Jeff Simmons, the bass player in the group. This is George Duke, the piano player. Oh, Mark sex Goldman. In, sex idol. Ian Underwood. Mark Goldman on Ian London. Underwood plays piano, and he handles my luggage. <laughs> and I'm his Back manager. there is Frank Zappa in the green. Frank has changed quite considerably since the last time we were in London. Come on, man. Come on up here, man. Come on, get a picture taken. James Taylor. Uh, yeah? What is this for? There's more guys, so save film. No, right. There's this is more like, to uh, come <laughs> than you think. <laughs> is it at least in color? Is it in color so you can see the beauty the, of life? Uh, what? Look at his hat. I mean, what is it? I mean, what the?
Kom så vi. Wild photographer talking. Move about a bit. Mill about. About. Change to it. Out. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Sad that our milling producers nearly did it. The Hulk. The Hulk. <laughs> Nice, yeah, nice, nice. Great, great. Like a circus hat. Get it? Quick, yeah, quick, quick! It. It's going, it's going! It's amazing, yeah, go yeah, decky! Yeah. We can't hold it no That's longer! It. This is Zappa, Frank Zappa, roll two. Frank Zappa, Liverpool concert. Group arrives in hall. Sink to silent turnover. Frank Zappa, first number at Liverpool. If you did, this will mean absolutely nothing to you. Friend and companion, Paladin, in the lobby of that plush 
and famous San Francisco Motel. Guys, I know right. You introduced, huh? Shut up. Hey, boy. Tell me what you want. You want lager and lime? Toyota Land Cruiser, barbecue pork, sesame seed pork, pineapple chicken, almond duck. Barbecue pork, sesame seed pork, and a special for the day. A pony cake. Ha ha ha. Well, you know like a tiny boy joke? You know like ha ha. You, you got the ass. You mad at the I'll tell you, hey boy, the little queen. Just book a room here in this plush San Francisco hotel for me and my sister. Uh, how did you commit incest? Anybody, anybody ask where I am? Tell them this. Proud and you 55. You never see 50 again, but you just hypnotically. And Paladin does just do hypnotically as he reaches into his back pocket and pulls forth the card of lust. Front pocket and pulls forth the card of lust, danger, romance, and adventure. Hand tank, 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 hand
Midland Hotel, Manchester. Okay. We're running. Okay. Carry running. You think in your program about the plastic people. What does it mean, plastic? Well, at the time that song was recorded, which was uh, 1967, <clears throat> it was a reference to people who were uh, in a certain social set in Los Angeles, wore a certain type of clothes and fixed their hair a certain way. That's what I was specifically referring to. But the, the concept has branched out since then as the term got into general use. It's sort of after, after the song was released, the term plastic came to be used for anything that anybody else didn't like. So, but the original meaning referred to girls who wore white plastic go-go boots with matching hats and went out with guys who wore um, powder blue alpaca sweaters and had razor cut hairdos. What uh, does it mean for you, plastic, now? I don't use the expression anymore. What do you use now for this expression? Well, I, I haven't stopped to think about that. Why? This didn't make any difference. To what? To talk about things that I don't like. You know, I just don't have the time. Uh, some girls, groupies, they are called, are typical for that what for many people is plastic? Not for me. What's for you? Typical groupies? No, what's, what uh, do groupies mean for you? Oh, they're a convenient form of recreation for a musician who's traveling on the road. And the groupies themselves uh, are understanding for a part them as a uh, kind of um, emancipated people, yeah? Some of them are, some of them aren't. Each one of them is a different person. For you, they are uh, emancipated or...? Well, most of the ones that I come in contact with are reasonably emancipated. Do you see in them, if you come in contact, something like an emancipated girl? Well, some of them more so than others. But and I think it's a good beginning. But the most of them are coming to you because you are a, something like an idol. No, most of them don't come to me because they're something like an idol. You know it sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem of emancipation, how do you think uh, people could emancipate, young people? I don't think there's any one solution that I could offer that would be useful to a large number of people because it's a personal problem. You know, everybody has their own set of little things that keep them tied down to a way of life that they might not uh, they might not enjoy. And <clears throat> there's as there's a, a different problem for each person, there's got to be a different way out of it for each person. What's your solution? Well, I got loose when I was about 18, I forgot. Uh, first thing that started me getting loose was Zen. Um, in your program, you have some social meaning. So uh, this program has a relation to this problem of emancipation. Could you try well, to... Well, that doesn't follow as a logical continuity. There are some elements of uh, emancipation in our program, but that's that's an assumption that you've made. Why is this wrong? Well, it's wrong because it's not 100% accurate. You know, you're correct up to a certain degree, but just to say because our program deals with sociological things that it necessarily deals with that over there. It deals with a lot of different things. So it would be better if we rephrase that question. Okay. Uh, but some parts of the program have social contents. Yes. And the relation of these social contents, to this problem of emancipation, to the problem of solutions. Could you explain this? Well, for one thing, the, the way we perform uh, our music on stage acts as an example to some people. You know, to, not to all of them, because they can't understand the 
the complete show, but uh, we have set arrangements for certain songs. But at any time during those set arrangements, I can turn around and go like that and make other things happen. That's because the people have come to grips with the problems that they need to face to deal with that music. So that they have most of those problems worked out in advance in their minds. So that when I change it or do something unusual, they're, they're free to let their imaginations go right at that moment. Do you know what I mean? Yes. What else? <clears throat> then sometimes the lyric content takes care of the... the you have uh, told me a year ago about uh, why you wouldn't take more so much so much lyrics, but now so most of the program has lyrics. That's because we have somebody, two people who can sing them. Who? Mark and Howard. They have been the turtles before, yeah. Yeah, that's right. They Could were the you turtles. Mark and, and Howard, Mark Bowman and Howard Kalen were the two lead singers from a group called the Turtles, and uh, they're good singers. So I figure that. Uh, Instead of performing old Mothers of Invention vocal material, I would write some more songs. The Mothers of Invention uh, have been finished for a time, and now they have come back. The new mothers. Are they new mothers? Are they new mothers? Are they a new group? Oh, I'd say the mood of the group is completely different. This, there's a similar spirit that exists between the two groups. That To roughly define it, it would be that uh, they w want to do something to the audience. They're not merely to entertain. There's some definite plans made to do something to the audience. That's the only continuum between the two groups because the first group uh, was not as competent musically as this group is, I don't think. I think we have better players in this group of mothers and the singers are better. And uh, I think it's got a better feeling to it. People seem to enjoy it more which people, uh, musicians or? Well, both, the audience and the musicians. Why do, why do you uh, bring so much old uh, material in the new program? Well, <clears throat> you've only seen one program by this group. We, that isn't all the stuff that we play. There's another maybe half an hour or 40 minutes of new material that you haven't seen us do. And so when you go on stage, <clears throat> and you say your name is the Mothers of Invention, I assume the audience expects you to play some of the songs that the Mothers of Invention were famous for. That's why we do Colony Vegetable and Mother People. But the material that we're playing now, <clears throat> most of it bears no resemblance to the way the old mothers played it. But the texts are the same. The texts are the same, sure. And also the, there's a reason for using those same texts because they're appropriate these days. I think that a song like Mom and Dad is still appropriate, and so is Concentration Moon. Um, all these old songs had been written by you, so it's the work of, of you and uh, it's not the work of the other musicians so much. Um, so most of these musicians have to repeat this work. Uh, what do you think uh, about this necessity for a musician who isn't you? I don't understand. What? Right. <coughs> you have the new mothers now, and you have had before the hot rats, and you have it still. Mm -hmm. and you have all the time new musicians, and mostly the musicians play your material. That's right. So uh, I think there could be also a conscience at a musician more to play his own music. What do you think of this problem? That the players want to play their own music? Yeah. If they really wanted to play their own music, they'd be off playing it, wouldn't they? Could they play it at you? Could they play it in, the, in our group? No. Sometimes I play other pieces of material, but the reason that I put the group together is so I could hear the things that I write. And it's the same way with anybody else in the group. If they wanted to write some material and get it played, well, and let them face the problems of putting together a group to make it happen. See, um, the way I think of the group, it's, a, it's an orchestra. I mean, it has the potential of an orchestra. It's a lot smaller, of course. But I want to uh, have a group at my disposal that will play the experimental things that I want to do. But it's something like an ego trip. No, not really. Why not? 
Well, for instance, wasn't there a composer named Haydn who had at his disposal an orchestra? And anytime you wanted to write something, you could hear it right away. And if you can hear what you write, that will allow you to improve what you write. Well, there's no orchestra available to me in the United States, okay? Or any place else, unless I go out and pay for it myself. And uh, if you're a composer and you want to earn a living, you're going to have to either do something that uh, is outside the field of music, because in the United States it's very hard for a composer to earn money from writing music. He has to keep a daytime job doing something else. And I didn't like that idea, so the easiest way would be to put together a self-supporting musical group that paid for itself and provided me with the musical opportunities that I needed. I think uh, the last month, uh, I think within the last years, you have become um, not only a composer, not only a musician, but you have gone to other medias also. Huh? Well, I've always been interested in film and uh, other visual mediums. When I was in school, I was doing uh, graphic arts and I've been working in film since 1958. It's just now that I have an opportunity to make those films on a larger scale and make films that, uh, that I can send out that other people can see. I made films for my own amusement up until that time. Now I can send them around. Why do you work multimedia? I have interest in those fields and I saw no reason why I should uh, not use the ability that I had in those fields. But always the people um, with whom you have to work, with whom you work, mm -hmm. uh, have to do the things you are thinking of. Yeah. They have to realize what you want. That's true. And they are paid for doing that. And they like to do it. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but they always have the opportunity to leave if they don't like it. Hmm. Um, what do you give the audience with this help of the musicians or other workers and the help of the whole technical material? What give? What do you give you? What do you give to the, them? The audience, yeah, with all this help. I give them the opportunity to participate in my fantasy. And that's enough. Well, I'm not. Oh, sorry. Not. Coming. <laughs> right. I'm running. And that's enough. There may be other benefits too. Um, there are different types of managers working for you. What kinds, for example? Uh, Herb Cohen is my partner, and he takes care of the booking of the group itself. He uh, arranges for the concerts. Dick Barber is our road manager. He arranges the transportation of the group, the shipping of the equipment, and uh, takes care of practical problems while we're out on the road. Herbie's job is more in the office, on the telephone, and negotiating the deals and the contracts. We have a press representative in Europe named Barbara Scott. And she sets up the press conferences and sometimes books hotels for us and takes care of things for us in Europe well, when we're in the United States. In the United States, there's an agent named Bert Zell, who uh, takes care of the booking. Um, he gets orders. He sits at a desk. Colleges or concert uh, promoters call him up and say, we want the group for such and such a thing. And then he passes those on to Herbie, and he gets a commission for that. Herbie gets a commission. Dick Barber does not get a commission. Barbara Scott does not get a commission. In Europe, we have promoters who are um, employed country by country. In Germany, it's Fritz Rau. Scandinavia, it's Newt Thorbenson. Here in England, it's been Roy Guest. And uh, I believe there's another guy that we're working with in Vienna. I can't remember his name. Are all these managers necessary? Um, they wouldn't be necessary if I had the time to do all that work myself. But one, for one thing, I'm not interested in doing that kind of work. And for another thing, I don't have any time to do it. If I were to spend all the time that Herbie spends on the telephone, I'd never be able to write anything. And they already something like a machine? Well, I wouldn't say it's like a machine because it's definitely not foolproof. You know, I wish it ran a little bit smoother because there's always problems. 
but they already built up between you and the real they already built up between you and the reality something like a wall many people who try to come to you and to work with you can't reach you well that's necessary because the public sees me like for instance I go to a town like Liverpool or Manchester they see me one time and they imagine that during all the rest of the time that I'm not there I'm sitting at home and I'm just relaxing and you know I'm I have a million dollars and they picture me spending a million dollars in the countryside. But that's not the way it is because I'm working all the time. And the amount of time that I spend working on projects, even like a, an arrangement for the group, I want to spend the time on, on those things that interest me. And there's a lot of opportunities that people want to bring to me, like the ones that you're saying the, the managers screen out. But I'm not interested in them because I don't have time to do them. And for me to just sit on the phone and turn all those people down would waste my time. So I got other people to do it for me. But it's this situation already is, an, is another wall. It's a wall between you, your business, and the reality. Because Why do you say that I'm divorced from reality? I think my reality is this ugly bed that I'm sitting in right here. I'm doing an interview with you. I've got a suitcase there. There is a fraudulent Thanksgiving dinner happening downstairs and I got a concert coming up in a couple hours. That's plenty of reality for me. Of course, but you have in your concert much meaning. This is meaning not only social meaning, not only political meaning, but for the people coming there it's something like reality and more than the music. Mm -hmm. So if you are divorced of reality or for example the most of the audience, of the reality of the most of the audience, right. you have only this reality you just have described. You but aren't in reality. No, I'm not in their reality. Their reality consists of their day-to-day -day work and their lives. And uh, they, if somebody, like, per, you have a person who works a, in an office, and that's his reality. The night after, uh, say, one night from the office, he's going to go to a concert to see the Mothers of Invention or to see anything that would be taking him out of his reality. He wants to see a different reality. He wants to see our reality. He doesn't want to see the reality of the guy sitting next to him. If the guy next to him at the office was up on the stage, he wouldn't go to see him, because he sees that all the time. So he wants to see an illusion? It's not an illusion. It's just something different from his life. And I would uh, say that the motivation of curiosity figures very heavily in bringing an audience to our concerts, because they're just wondering exactly what are we doing or they're expecting to see something um, unusual. But I uh, mentioned this problem because I think this situation I and you just have described is a situation which is similar to the situations of many bigger pop groups. So these groups have become uh, separated of much what is for example, my living and the living of others. I'm also already separated of mm -hmm. much of the life. So we... Um, but let me say one thing, mm -hmm. that the separation that I experience now between the way I live and uh, the work that I do and the audience was there even before I got into the pop music. For you? Sure, certainly. I, I don't feel that I'm relating any differently to uh, the people outside of my circle of friends than I would ten years ago. But I think you will have had uh, more direct communication between uh, your neighbors and people you saw, you saw somewhere than now, because now there is this machine. I have, been, well, I have been these three days mm -hmm. with you on tour, and I have seen many situations when the people couldn't reach you. So there's a machine between, and what? This is wire track only. Um, so the uh, the people who tried now to come can't come. Who, and for instance? Oh, I have met some people, for example, at some underground papers, mm -hmm. who uh, didn't even know that you have been in the city. So uh, then they tried and. They had to go to the publicist, and the publicist is looking, oh, is he allowed to go to Frank Zappa or not? 
for example, my own situation, I, uh, if I'm at you, I can be here. If the publicist is there, he is looking, if I'm allowed to be in this moment, at this room. Mm -hmm. So there is a machine going. Mm -hmm. And the question for me is... I think that the use of the word machine is a very bad semantic practice at this point. Yeah. Okay, there is something going. And this something, uh, the question is, if this something is um, still so strong going that you become already a function of it, what's your idea to this problem? I don't believe that I'm a function of that machine. First of all, I wouldn't have it any other way than the way it is now, except more efficient, because my time is so scarce. If, if I don't have time to spend working on the creative end of the projects, they don't get done. If I'm involved in a film now, I have a certain amount of time where I have to turn out a vast quantity of work. I don't mind doing interviews but I want to be able to give everybody a chance if they're going to interview. So therefore, when a person comes to me and asks for an interview, I would rather they didn't come to me at all. They'd go to a publicist, the publicist would figure a certain block of time and divide it up and say, you have these interviews. So I cooperate and I go at the time that those interviews are set up. Most of the time, Barbara Scott never even asked me, do you want to do an interview with so-and-so? She just sets them up. Mm -hmm. So like, <clears throat> to me, it's a convenience. It helps me work. And uh, that's the only thing it is. It's not any mysterious mystique or, you know, it's not showbiz, it's just practical. And this practical model you have to, to use there is necessary because you have a special idea of your whole work. It's necessary because there are only 24 hours in a day. When it's possible, I like to sleep eight of those hours. During the rest of that time, I like to get as much work done as possible. In order to perform a concert on stage, there is a bunch of pre-planning that has to happen. Your rehearsals, your travel, checking in a hotel, stupid things like getting something to eat or getting a cup of coffee when you want to. That's one set of problems. I have maybe 20 concerts during the next uh, month. Okay, Each one of those concerts is prefaced by a different set of problems. Now you take that whole block of work and put it over here. Besides that, I have to finish a screenplay, write some more orchestra music for the film, and work with Cal on the animation for the film all simultaneously during the next month. You know, so I'm just tied in to a very busy schedule. We come to Europe maybe once or twice a year, and we haven't done a tour on the continent for a long time. So I know that there's going to be a lot of interviews. So Consequently, every minute for the next month, or even, well, up until the middle of February, is taken care of. And if it weren't fixed up that way, I wouldn't get anything done. Or the quality of work would go down, neither of which I would enjoy to see happen. And this work has to be done. I'm not, I'm not uh, looking for this interview problem or so. Mm. For me, it's only a uh, part of, of the whole thing if other people, if you, if I, if people are working this way, mm -hmm. still get contact to the other people, because the interviews is already very near to us, but the other people, so you make your work, you think this work is important, but perhaps you become alienated already by this work, because it's so strong that you lose any contact to that what is happening in this world. First of all, my work is the only contact to those people out there. In, in Chicken, almond duck, Honda, 
Toyota, Panasonic, what do you want, Pagan? You old sack. What you say, Pagan?